What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Arnie's. We are three smoke jumpers with nothing better to do. I'm Austin Terry, and I gotta go full ghost. I'm Keith Baker, and I'm gonna call you guys buddy. And I'm Matt Johnson, and I wish Tyler Perry was my boss. On today's show, we'll be catching up on a couple of new releases, but first, Matt, we just wrapped up our latest retrospective and review series. What was it like returning to the MCU Phase 1, and why should people check out that series? It was really interesting. Um, I think overall, with each movie, with those six that we talked about, I think for the most part, they were hits. I don't think if you go back and watch them, you'll be super disappointed by any of them. And I think, especially with some of the later entries, we found movies that we thought we wouldn't like that much, but ended up actually enjoy more than we expected. So I think that aspect of it, it's pretty cool. And then if you're somebody that just finished up watching Falcon and Winter Soldier lately, like we did, kind of gives you an excuse to go back to where it all started. So if you're interested in our thoughts on the beginning of the MCU, you can find it there. And Keith, speaking of the Falcon and Winter Soldier, we don't have a bonus episode on the schedule for a few weeks. When will we be back to a two show week and what will we be covering? Yeah, so we will be covering the new miniseries Loki which premieres on June 9th, and those will release every Wednesday, so our episodes will be available on Fridays. All right, and with that, let's get into our main topic for today. We have two new movies on our hands, both led by heavy hitters. We will first be discussing the Michael B. Jordan-led Tom Clancy's Without Remorse. After that, it's time to break down Angelina Jolie's latest action thriller, Those Who Wish Me Dead. Matthew and Keith, without telling me which movie you are talking about, I want you to give me your non-spoiler thoughts on both of these films. Is one worth checking out over the other? Do we have an Academy Award winner on our hands? Are they both duds? Let me know what you're feeling right now. And Matthew, I'm going to start with you. All right. Yeah. So if I can't uh, distinguish them yet, I would just say that one I thought had potential, but ultimately its biggest sin was that it was just kind of boring. And then the other one, I didn't really know anything about it going in and was pleasantly surprised. So when it comes to me, there's definitely one here that I would recommend over the other. Are any of these going to win any major awards or any of them like super worthy of writing them about? Probably not, but I still think they each have some good elements for sure. Yeah, I'll agree to that. I think they both have good elements, Um, but yeah, one of them definitely was a dud for me. The other one I actually enjoyed um, for the most part. There were some things lacking in it for me, but uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say without giving anything away. I think both of these were kind of stinkers, but I think one stinks slightly less than the other one. One one is a, a little bit less smelly for me, I guess. Yep. So though there's some of our general kind of non-spoiler thoughts on both of these films, it sounds like we all kind of feel roughly the same way. We don't really have a standout movie here today. And with that, we are now going to transition into the spoiler section of our episode today. So if you haven't seen Without Remorse or Those Who Wish Me Dead, Do not go any further in this podcast because we are going to be talking about spoilers for both of those movies. Check them both out and then come on back to hear our thoughts. Okay, so let's first get into Without Remorse. Uh, Keith, why don't you run down our cast and crew? So this one is directed by Stefano Salima. You may know him from Sicario. Day of the Soldado, written by Taylor Sheridan and Will Staples. Uh, Sheridan is also known for Hell or High Water, uh, Wind River, both Sicario films, and our next film, Those Who Wish Me Dead. Movie score composed by John Z. And going into our cast, we got a returning Michael B. Jordan, you may know him from the Creed movies, as John Kelly, Jody Turner Smith as Karen Greer, Jamie Bell as Robert Ritter, Lauren London as Pam Kelly and Guy Pierce as Thomas Clay. So any highlights, positives, or negatives with this cast and crew? Oh, you guys didn't want to name, like, Dallas or Lumberjack, or whatever the other two uh, special off guys were? I I don't even know any of them. I can't even remember, (laughs) like, what they looked like. (laughs) I'll go ahead and take the obvious one. Uh, The only reason this movie isn't, like, a pure disaster is because of Michael B. Jordan. Uh, The guy just brings so much, like, charisma to everything he does that, like, his performance is at least enjoyable. Jodie Turner-Smith and Jamie Bell, I think, do the best they can with what they're given. Uh, But ultimately, I I think the main standout here is Michael B. Jordan. Uh, Yeah, for me, I'll agree with that. Everything with everything you said on Michael B. Jordan. um, And I'll just shout out Guy Pearce as well. While I think his character probably could have been, you know, a little bit developed more. uh, I did think he played the secretary pretty well. 
Yeah, I don't have too much to add, really. I think Michael B. Jordan as the lead of the cast. Luckily, he turned in a pretty good performance. Nothing special, certainly not anywhere near his best, but still worth checking out for that reason. Uh, everybody else, yeah, Jane Turner-Smith, Jamie Bell, Lauren London, I thought they did a good job, like Austin said, with what they were given. And then Guy Pierce. I kind of also agree with what Keith said. It's like, he did a good job. I think there's issues with the character, but I think the least of this movie's issues were its cast. So before we move on, Matt, you want to run down our plot summary for Without Remorse? Yeah, so our general log line is just our plot follows John Kelly, a U.S. Navy SEAL who sets out on a path of revenge after his pregnant wife and unit members are killed by Russian hitmen. All right, let's get into our roundtable discussion. Keith, do you want to start us off today? Yeah, so I know we'll dive a little bit more deep into it, but just to start us off here, yeah, I th- I think the plot for the most part was pretty unoriginal. I mean, we've seen the same template in so many action movies before, you know, to where you could predict what was going to happen after the first, like, 15, 20 minutes of the film. Special Forces badass gets something or someone taken away from them and then has to go out and get revenge and make it right at the end. Uh, I was just hoping for something different here. Yeah, I think the biggest issue with the movie is kind of like what you're saying there is just that I'm not entirely sure it knew what it wanted to be. Um, I certainly there's tons of examples of movies that I like that are kind of more focused on the whole political side of military um, just related stories, I guess you could say, whether or not they're kind of more pulpy or revenge based like this one doesn't really matter. So I like a lot of stories like that in both movies, TV and whatever media they can be found in. And then, of course, I also am really down for crazy fun action um and this movie definitely marketed that it kind of had that and i just don't think it does either of those aspects particularly good uh maybe if they had like picked one over the other they could have developed it more but yeah like you said the plot itself is just really bare bones basic a political revenge story and the politics is not very interesting um and it just it just sounds the actors are saying political jargon over and over again and then the action is fine for when it's there but just not enough of it based on the story they were setting up so that's that's kind of my issue with it and yeah as well like you said Keith it's definitely pretty predictable um I'm a big guy Pierce fan but they gave us no red herrings like it, it's they're trying to tell us that Jimmy Bell's the bad guy but if he's the only one that they're saying it is, and it's obviously not him, so it's Guy Pierce. So we, I knew where it was going the entire time. I kept waiting for the movie to turn Michael B. Jordan loose. Like the way the movie was marketed, it was like Michael B. Jordan on his own using his elite skill set to get revenge on the people that killed his wife. And then the whole movie, he's just like on a team that seems to be holding him back. We never got to a point where it was like, all right, here's Michael Jordan. He's alone. He's got to figure this out. He's got nobody on his side. And like I kept waiting for it to get to that point, and it never happened. As for the plot being like unoriginal, I think that's okay. I don't think we need like a groundbreaking plot as long as you can have a good performance and an interesting enough like action sequences to just move us forward. And ultimately, like Michael B. Jordan was good. Nobody else was really a standout, and the action was kind of generic too. So like all those combined together in one bag kind of made for a pretty underwhelming movie. I thought they should have picked one or the other, like pick a revenge story or pick a political story. But it was kind of they tried to combine it in a weird way. It was also weird, too, because whenever they're like putting the team together or the mission together, Greer's whole point is like he's unfit for combat. Michael B. Jordan is like, you need somebody like me right now. I'm not tied to anybody. I can get in by myself. Like I can do things that the military can't. But then they still put him on a team. So I I just don't understand what they're trying to set up here. It's like I need to go go alone. And they're like, all right, but here's your team. It was so confusing to me. Yeah. It's like, why did they just make him ghost to begin with? Thank you, Keith. I don't know. I I don't understand. I want him to be a ghost after like the opening sequence. Yeah, I agree. It was just really confusing. Um, The whole his inclusion in in this team and then where it goes from there. And then I guess at the end, we're supposed to look back and say, oh, I guess him getting put on was part of the plan to get him killed when he got there. Um, But regardless, you shouldn't have to go through this many hoops for this kind of story. Also, to your point, it's like, if they had let him go a little bit sooner, we probably could have gotten some more character development from him and some cooler action scenes. Instead, it's just kind of boring team banter. Yeah. So we've kind of jumped around it a little bit, but uh, there is action in the movie technically. It doesn't sound like any of us were really blown away by it, but I mean, was there any kind of highlights of the action for you guys? Any of the sequences stand out? I had two. The first one is the one you see in the trailer where he lights the car like 
in a circle of fire and interrogates the guy. And then for me, the standout is the prison sequence. I, I was hoping we were going to be in prison longer, but like to see him actually preparing and like making himself wet so he's harder to grab and, and then like taking out the riot shield guys was a pretty fun sequence. Yeah, I like this prison sequence too. Um, but yeah, like you said, I was hoping to get more of like the Russian mob. Like if he was like eating at the cafeteria, like with them staring at him maybe or like trying to like shank him or something like that. I thought that would have been kind of cool, and him having, like, a bigger prison brawl with, like, the actual inmates probably would have been pretty cool to see. Yeah, I definitely thought there was going to be more to that whole sequence. Um, I I think, for me, there's really only two action scenes that are even really worth it. The prison one's cool, but it it just goes by so quickly. Um, The ones that, like, are actually, they feel huge in scale, and they clearly spent a lot of time and thought on, and I thought for the most part it paid off, was the whole sequence of the airplane going down was I thought pretty cool. Oh, that was sweet. Um, yeah, that was, and cool. then watching, and then having to, that whole setup to it to not just be to get to the out of the plane to like get out of into the water or whatever. There was this whole element of him having to swim through a sinking plane to get to the boat that they all needed, and then then getting to the surface, which I thought was really awesome. And then the other one, which definitely wasn't as good, but I did like how there was so many different moving parts to it. Was whenever he tries to sacrifice himself on top of the roof. And I just liked how it goes from a pretty cool gunfight of him shooting down to then shooting at people on the roof and then falling through a window and then having to fight on a staircase while like gas is coming in. And then where that went, I thought I thought it was pretty cool. I think the plane sequence was definitely my favorite, but that one I thought was pretty exciting as well. The rooftop one is cool with the different planes of action, how it like moves from the roof like down through the stairwell, like you said. I was just so confused if he was actually trying to kill himself or he was just trying to be a diversion because I I wasn't sure if when he's shooting down from the roof, if he's like purposely trying to miss because he's just like kind of loosely tossing the grenades. I really I was so unclear if he's like trying to win the fight or just like shoot bullets up so people come after him. Yeah, I thought he was going to blow himself up there at first with the, the whole bomb thing that he had in the backpack. And he throws his guns away, too, which was weird. Yeah. Because I know if he, if they were to leave one of their bodies, an American body there, then it would cause more tension with the Russians or whatever. So that's why they took the other guy's dead body away. And so he was, I thought he was just going to blow himself up. That way there wouldn't be any evidence that Americans were there. The marketing for this movie was pretty great. Like I was actually fairly excited going into this one. But then when the movie actually plays out, there were so many times where I was expecting it to just go full John Wick and become the Michael B. Jordan show. And ultimately it never got there. When they finally established that he needs to go, quote, full ghost, there's only one more scene left and the movie ends. So was that like as disappointing for you guys as it was for me? Because I thought we still had like a good amount of movie left. And I was really shocked when I realized it was wrapping up. Yeah, it definitely felt like there was supposed to be more. I mean, they made this whole setup of like, here's your money. Here's what you need to go full ghost. Nobody will even know. Everybody thinks you're dead. And then it doesn't even really amount to anything particularly cool. It just is him then showing up in America to take out Guy Pierce's character by, you know, driving into the water. So it's not like anything even really cool came of him having to go ghost anyway. And then once he accomplishes that part of the mission, he just basically changes his name and then he's totally free to do whatever he wants. So, yeah, I'm glad there wasn't more left because at that point it did feel like it was dragging on for me. But I was surprised that that final sequence was all that element amounted to. Yeah, everything did wrap up really quickly. And as far as Guy Pierce's character's motives were still pretty unclear to me of why they were I mean, he said he he stated why, but they were still kind of dumb motives. <laughs> to, to that. It's so dumb. <laughs> we need a war with Russia. The Cold <laughs> yeah. War was the best America's ever been, essentially. It unifies the people. Like, <laughs> so well, we'll okay. make it happen again was his whole thing. It always feels like these types of movies just like can't help themselves and they always have to throw in like a corrupt politician or something. And when it's interesting, that's cool. But I kind of wish... Like you've already said, Keith, I really do wish more of the movie had been Michael B. Jordan in prison dealing with the Russian mob. And the second half is him getting out and going ghost. And then like basically he like got all the information he needed in prison and then just spent the second half of the movie tracking down the conspiracy. And then the premise can be, what does it look like when an elite Navy SEAL gets locked in prison with the Russian mob? Like that sounds like a way cooler movie to me than what we got. Yeah, I'm in full agreement. I mean, it's a perfect example of something I think I've brought up in past podcasts where they always have to make it like this worldwide thing, you know, with one person. It's like, why can't it ever just be this individual story? Yeah. That's that's basically, I think, where they screwed up with this movie. They just didn't really justify the story they set up, I think. I, like we already talked about, once they leave on that team mission, the whole climax is basically finding out that the Rykov guy is also with the CIA. And it's just like, 
okay, I don't really know this guy, so I don't really care. <laughs> and then he just like tries to kill them both, and of course it doesn't work. So I, I guess I'm not going to say I wish would have gotten more of the prison stuff but because it was intriguing. But I, my issue is more just that what they did do, I just was so bored by. I mean, kind of like at the top, that's what I said, is just like there was little bits and pieces there that were intriguing, but – it just was never compelling, kind of like after the halfway point. And it just felt so cliche and nothing new, nothing I haven't seen before. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It just was kind of a dud, like we already said. I, I don't know. It was just boring and disappointing. It's kind of a shame, too, because I, I did feel like the like opening 20 minutes of this movie were pretty promising. And yeah. I was actually like on board and entertained. And then it just nosedives after that. 100%. 100%. Lots of potential, though. Lots of potential. Well, I mean, speaking of potential, I feel like lately on this show with the whole MonsterVerse and Mortal Kombat seemingly getting sequels, uh, we've just talked a lot about movies that have potential. Even if they're good or bad, we know there's going to be more. So with the post credit scene in this movie, they basically set up that uh, Michael B. Jordan's character is going to lead the infamous Rainbow team, which is the titular Rainbow Six that Tom Clancy has written about, and there's been games and movies and all that. So are you excited about that idea as a sequel? Because first of all, before we even get into that, I just I, w- I was laughing, to be honest, because the movie ends with him taking the new name and leaving. And then right after the credits, it just goes one year later and he's back. And then Jimmy Bell's just like, gosh, it's good to have you back, partner. It's like we just that saw made him. me laugh so hard. Yeah, it's just like we just saw him leave. Um, so it, it was really goofy and sure hearing him say rainbow was cool, but th- out of all like the sequels and universes and all that shit we've talked about lately on the show, this whole Clancy verse <laughs> is certainly probably the lowest in terms of what I would care to see. It's not even one of those things where it's like, I think this movie had potential, so maybe a sequel could do it better. I just don't really care. If we never get anything more from this, I'm totally fine. Uh, I didn't watch the post credit scene, but from what... <laughs> From what you told me, it sounds really dumb. <laughs> One year later, I'm back. And it's just, Keith, it's just Jamie Bell walking That's up what to it a is, guy uh, like in a shadow, and it's just Michael B. Jordan staring at the Washington Monument. <laughs> it's so dumb. I'm interested if you bring in a whole new, I don't want to say cast because I did like Jamie Bell, but basically bring in a whole new directing crew, write an actual interesting story. And then give Michael B. Jordan a better like supporting, like a larger supporting crew, since it, since the focus of this movie is actually a team. Give him like a good team and a good a good cast to work with, and let's see what we can do from there as well. I okay. Agree. Yeah, I could see that. I was also seeing that there is potentially plans to uh, have the John Clark character interact with Jack Ryan. Maybe I don't know if y'all have seen that show on Amazon Prime. Yeah, but they're both I was gonna say Prime Studios. Yeah, so I've seen it. That could be kind of cool with Michael B. Jordan and John Krasinski. Like maybe there's ways for. Michael B. Jordan to show up in the Jack Ryan show, I'd be totally down for that. That could be cool. That could be cool. Yeah. So guys, what do you think? If if anybody is listening this far that hasn't watched Without Remorse yet, is it even worth checking out or can you skip this one? I would say it's worth checking out. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't completely turned away and bored from it. I mean, I was entertained by it Uh, and the cast is good. So yeah, I mean, I'd check it out. Get your own opinion on it. Um, for me, I would probably say skip and it's not even because I hated the movie and it's not even with, because it was boring. Like I said earlier, the main reason I would say is because if you're somebody looking for like an interesting revenge, like weaving the web of intrigue storyline, you're not going to get that. And if you're somebody that just wants cool action, you're going to get it twice in the span of a two hour movie. And I just don't think it's worth it. Again, it's not terrible. It's decently well made. It's just, I can't really recommend it based on either of its main kind of marketing pushes yeah i would say skip and go watch john wick that's the better version of this and you'll be way more entertained Mm -hmm. i will say though that a shirtless shot of michael b jordan in the prison i was like that's my superman oh wow (laughs) oh wow (laughs) all right guys let's change gears now and let's get into Those Who Wish Me Dead. Keith, can you run down our cast and crew once again? Yeah, so this one's also directed by Taylor Sheridan, which we just mentioned, because he also wrote Without Remorse. Uh, it's written by Michael Corta. Uh, he also wrote the book that this one's based off of. It's also written by Charles uh, Levitt and Taylor Sheridan. So, movie score composed by Brian Tyler. 
And going into our cast here, we have Miss Angelina Jolie as Hannah, Finn Little as Connor, Nicholas Holt as Patrick, Aiden Gillen as Jack, John Bernthal as Ethan, Medina Singhorn as Allison, and Tyler Perry as Arthur. All right, guys. Any highlights on the cast and crew for Those Who Wish Me Dead? Uh, it's obviously Tyler Perry. I mean, this was the best performance I've ever seen from him. <laughs> I like Tyler Perry, yeah. Um, I like when Tyler Perry does these like random dramatic movies, like Gone Girl, um, and then this, and like he he kind of just randomly pops up in like thrillers like this sometimes, and he's always really good, even if he's just in it for a little bit. Uh, so it was fun seeing him pop up. I wish we could have gotten more of him. As for just a standout, I'll take John Berthal. I just like when he pops up in things. I think he's so good in everything he does, and. His character here is fun, at least, so I liked every time he was on screen. Yeah, I think uh, here's another example. Um, I usually find myself saying this, that uh, I can't really pick one, just because I think this cast all the way through is really good. I like Nicholas Holt and Aiden Gillen as these like weird assassins that are brothers. Um, and then, yeah, Angelina Jolie and Finn Little, I like their dynamic. And then I, I always forget to call out like the other side of the crew. So I definitely would shout out Taylor Sheridan. I really like Wind River and Hell or High Water. Um, and this was another, I thought, solid directing job from him. I know we all have different thoughts on the movie, but ultimately I thought his directing stood out. So I'd call him out too. Yeah, I mean, I think y'all hit it on all points. I'll just say stand out for me was uh, Aiden Gillen as Jack. I thought he's a pretty yeah. uh, menacing kind of dude. And I haven't really seen him in too much, but I did like his performance as uh, this weird assassin creepy dude. Yeah, I liked it. I'll also mention Finn Little, just because it's really hard to find, like, child actors that aren't annoying, and I thought what we got from the Connor character at least, like, was interesting enough to carry the movie forward, and for acting across from Angelina Jolie, I felt like he did a great job. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, too. Okay, so before we get into our roundtable for this movie, Matt, can you run down our plot summary? Yeah, so this one follows a boy who witnesses the murder of his father and goes on the run with his smoke jumper, played by Angelina Jolie in the Montana wilderness to escape a pair of assassins who are hired to silence him. Okay, so I'll go ahead and kick off the roundtable for this one. Uh, For me, it really feels like they didn't know exactly what they wanted this movie to be. It was marketed as an action thriller, but then there's really only one action sequence in the movie. At points, it's a disaster movie, but the villains also kind of give off some No Country for Old Men vibes. What did you guys want this movie to be, and were there any elements that intrigued you or left you wanting more? Yeah, for me, I mean... As usual, I did not read or watch any trailers for this movie going into it, so I went into it pretty blind and really didn't know what to expect. So, yeah, so it started off with the whole firefighting aspect with Angelina Jolie and her her firefighter buddies and all that. So, yeah, I thought it was going to be something along those lines, and and I thought maybe there was was some people who were trying to be some, like, behind-the-scenes, like, environmental thing going on for people trying to start fires and going after the people putting them out or something like that. But yeah, that's what I was expecting to go into, but I, I didn't expect this whole forensic accounting with uh, Connor's dad and Tyler Perry as this bad guy sending two assassins. But I ended up enjoying what we got, though, and it was just a overall basic thriller, and I like the elements from the firefighting theme bleeding into it. Yeah, I'm with Keith. I really like this movie. I didn't watch any trailers or anything going in, so marketing issues didn't really affect me. Uh, I didn't know it was supposed to be an action thriller, but yeah, I mean, and the action itself is is lacking. I mean, there's some, I guess, I don't even know what you would call them. I mean, there's scenes with, like, gunplay and fighting and all that, not much, but there was enough to kind of get me excited during some tense scenes, which I enjoyed, but I guess also just knowing Taylor Sheridan's background with some of his other his other movies, they they tend to feel like they should be action movies, but then it ends up being a bit more nuanced than that, which I think is kind of cool. So maybe knowing that kind of prepared me for this. But again, I didn't watch the trailer, so I didn't know regardless. And as for what I would change, I don't know. I like I kind of like what Keith said there. I like how they have this backstory for Angelina Jolie's character that does kind of bleed in and tie into various aspects of the main story in terms of how to kind of deal with these assassins, how her knowledge of like how fire spreads kind of impacts their path and stuff like that. So I thought it was cool. I thought it was different than most thrillers. And I think the setting helped with that. The characters helped. And ultimately, yeah, I liked what we got. So I don't have any issues in terms of like, did I wish we would have gotten more of something or whatever. I, I kind of liked how it pieced together in weird and intriguing ways. I don't have an issue that there wasn't a ton of action. For me, it's just more of like 
they were taking so many different routes that were really cool, but then they, I, I feel like we never got enough of it. Like Angelina Jolie being a smoke jumper, like that profession is so interesting and, and was one of the things that had me excited for this movie. And there's just not enough of it. Like, I don't, I don't really don't get what the point was of making her character a smoke jumper because we don't really get any scenes of her like actually dropping in to fight wildfires. The only knowledge of, of fighting fires that she uses in the movie is, hey, we need to turn around. So like, I just felt like we could have gotten way more from that character and that background and had like some really interesting smoke jumping scenes in the movie. Yeah, I guess. Um, I think for me, I appreciated her being a smoke jumper because we saw those kids that basically died, I guess, on her watch or because of her, if you want to put it that way. So that obviously kind of impacted her interactions with Connor. And so then her being able to save him at the end, I guess, is kind of like her redemption. So I think it was used as more of like a redemption arc than actual like making it for action scenes or just showing the ins and outs of that profession. So again, it worked for me, but I can understand maybe wanting to focus more on it too. My biggest thing though is why isn't Connor one of those kids? Like why is not the first like 30 minutes of the movie all the smoke jumping cool stuff and then she stumbles upon Connor in the wildfire and then that's how they get hooked up and then she has to kind of try to lead him away. Like I felt like that would have been a better way to work in the smoke jumping stuff. Yeah, but then I don't think the assassin thing would have worked. And for me, I guess that's the difference. For me, that was what was more intriguing. Kind of like this typical thriller plot of this guy dies and his son has this information. Assassins are after him. But then she runs into this ex-smoke jumper. So that's what worked for me. So, yeah, I guess I just personally thought the whole assassin aspect was more interesting. And I just don't think they could have done both. What I'm saying, though, is you you can still do the assassins. I'm just saying whenever Connor has to run away from the car crash... Have him then stumble into a wildfire on accident, and then he he meets up with Angelina Jolie's character. So you still have the assassins chasing him and all that really cool No Country for Old Men type stuff, but then we just have a better way of showcasing all the smoke jumping stuff too. Yeah, I don't know if I would have liked that, but yeah, what do you think, Keith? Did, did, would that would have worked for you, do you think? Uh, I mean, yeah, that could have worked as well, but uh, I think I was, I was happy with what we got. I mean, we did get some good like smoke jumping knowledge whenever, like towards the end of the movie, whenever they're fighting Taylor Holt's character. And the fire's coming in, and she tells him to run this many yards and get into the the stream and all that. So we did get a little nod from there, there from her there. And then whenever um, her and Connor go into the uh, creek to take shelter while the fire's coming in, uh, you can tell that she had a little bit of knowledge of what to do there too. So you got a little bit, maybe. But for your um, side of things, Austin, uh, that you're pitching, maybe could have gotten like a longer opening sequence with them um, yeah. doing the smoke jumping. Just to kind of establish that. That's really all I'm looking for. I still liked what we got. I just wanted more of the smoke jumping side of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this movie, for the most part, nailed it. I mean, it wasn't the best thriller I've seen in a long by a long shot, but it's probably one of the better ones I've seen, you know, in recent years. Uh, I really like the setting in Montana with the whole firefighting backstory that we kind of just talked about. And I like that all that kind of bled into the whole assassination plot. Um, and the two assassins were believable and, you know, all the characters of the town I was rooting for. But yeah. But while I kind of liked how simple and straightforward the story was, was there anything lacking here for you guys? No, not with what we got. I think, um, there could have been some cool opportunities for fleshing out maybe even all the characters to a degree. Like, I don't need to know exactly why the assassins are doing what they're doing, but their whole, this organization they work for, that seemed kind of intriguing. And then there were some things that were left kind of intentionally vague. But I think for the most part, I liked what we got. You know, I, I think seeing how, like you said, this whole town of people get pulled into this. I actually liked that it wasn't just Angelina and Jolie stumbling upon this kid and like getting him to town. I liked that uh, John Bernthal, Medina Sanghorn, um, everybody that we're kind of introduced to runs into these assassins or this fire and they have to confront it in some way. And they kind of all play at least a little bit of a role in the finale. So I was surprised by that. So that was probably like my biggest uh, plus for the film my biggest thing in terms of lacking is just i just wanted to learn more about everybody like kind of like matt said the um aspect of the organization that the assassins work for i thought was really cool and i was hoping we were going to get more about that i the, my favorite thing about those two characters is they're doing this like really just despicable deadly job but then they have these like basically like office complaints about like, we don't have enough funding or we need a bigger team. Like <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought that stuff was really cool. And, and I, I wanted more of that. Um, like I said, I, I wanted more of the smoke jumping stuff. And then a another plus I'll give the movie too, is I like that some aspects of it weren't predictable. 
like whenever the assassins show up at Allison's house, you're totally expecting like, oh, they're just going to kill her. It's going to really piss off Ethan. But we come to find out that Allison is a survivalist and she teaches these classes. So she gets away and is able to help out in the final scene. So I like those like kind of smaller tweaks on this typical story that they added into this one. So what about Tyler Perry's character? I mean, he, and Connor's dad. Did you want to know what those findings were, or was it kind of cool not knowing what it was, just knowing that it was some something that was going to blow Tyler Perry's uh, case with a DA? I think we got just the right amount from Connor's dad, but I kind of did want more of maybe not Tyler Perry's character, but just more of the organization that they work for and 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 why they're hiring these assassins, or or if it even is Tyler Perry's organization, or or if whatever Connor's dad was working on contracted Tyler Perry to then kind of hire these assassins. Like I I kind of want more of that dynamic. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't fully know how I feel about it yet. I think ultimately there's a lot like I said that was vague, but uh, yeah, I think I would agree at least for now. I I like how um we didn't know too much. There were elements with the whole organization besides the assassins that I was kind of like, well, "How does that work? That seems weird." Um and there just were some like little plot like conveniences like that that were kind of bugging me for a little bit, but then I got over it. Um I I think the important thing is that the assassins they felt like they nailed that aspect. Yeah, maybe the organization, no, but all like the most important things that were more integral, at least in the moment of the movie, they seem to be knocking it out of the park, at least for me. And I think kind of going back to our other point, I mean, I think one of the best decisions they made was to have that scene where like they're showing how screwed these assassins are by they literally just murder someone that sees their face. So it just happens to stop on the road. But then it's like they do have this weird code despite that. Like they had that awesome element of like, okay, at this point forward, if anybody sees our face, we kill them. So whenever they show up at the house, it's like, oh no, this is really bad. Like obviously she's going to die now. But then, like you said, that whole survivalist aspect was really cool. And then when John Bernthal shows up, it's like, oh no, now he's going to die right away. And then he ended up being able to stick it out for a little bit longer. So kind of how they bounced all that back and forth was pretty cool. And like it led to some tense scenes because. It was like, oh, Jesus, like, what are they going to do? And it's like, I guess they won't kill a pregnant person, but they'll make John Bernthal kill a kid so he doesn't have to. So it was it was just crazy. It almost seemed like they were trying to redeem the assassins a little bit by saying we won't kill a pregnant lady. Like, I, I feel like if you're going to have these types of villains, they just kind of need to be all bad so you can root against them. Yeah, they were pretty freaking creepy. So it's like, yeah, why was the pregnant thing the line i was so confused why that was the line like i, I feel like you just don't give those characters a line you, know, you yeah. can still have all the same scenes but just don't be like this is how bad i don't want to kill a pregnant woman it's like we've seen you murder a whole family in the opening of the movie we know like that's killing true. people is not an issue for you you literally just shot a lady who asked if someone went over the railing when you could have just said oh no it's all good and she would have just driven away <laughs> yeah uh one thing about the assassins i want to ask you guys what did you guys think of like their opening with the uh the house exploding and all that. Did you like that? You didn't actually see how they did that, how they just walked out and he was like, there's blood on your shirt. Yeah, that was good. I really liked it because it kind of made you realize how efficient they are and how they're like really good at their jobs too. I also liked how they were predicting exactly what Connor was going to do. Like we need to get on the road quickly because he's going to see us on the news and he's going to flee. Yeah, it also showed us how they were able to find out where they were going because of the whole like family element, the person's dead, but then it's like, where would they go? And they find a picture of John Bernthal. And it's like, well, they'd probably go here because clearly they, they're friends with somebody in law enforcement. So why not go and refuge with that person? So it's like, oh, OK, so they're actually kind of giving us insight into their process as well, which I wasn't expecting and definitely appreciated that. Like everything we've been talking about, for the most part, I liked. But there's still just something about it that left a bad taste in my mouth. Like, I still don't think it's a great movie. Like, I felt like we had smart villains and intimidating villains. But overall, I still think it's kind of just OK and kind of blah. But I can't really put my finger on why that is. Yeah. No, I mean, I get that. Sometimes that's just how we feel. I mean, I've seen movies that are well made, but, you know, they can just not feel complete. So I guess before we kind of closed out here, I was just curious because for me, when it comes to thrillers of any kind, any genre, it doesn't really matter. I think the ending can really make or break it despite how much you liked it or disliked it before that. So I was just curious, like, what do you guys think of the whole demise of our assassin characters escaping the fire right as it's coming in? And then that quick little epilogue with Hannah and Connor. No issues with the epilogue or the final fight with the assassins. I was just so confused at how the fire got put out and how Allison didn't die. It literally like shows the fire coming in and going over the creek, and then the next shot is just the fire's out. And I just was so confused about how all that wrapped up. Yeah, 
I'm no expert, certainly, but my guess, the way I read it, maybe, Keith, I don't know, maybe you have some insight, maybe you know literally any more than I do, but I just read it as they just had to hold it out in the water, so enough time for the fire to burn what was there, because I just read it as, like, once the fire burns the full tree down, like the grass, anything that can burn, once it gets past that, then it can't really keep burning, I guess, you know, if that makes sense. Like, once there's just ash on the ground, maybe it can't burn. So that's how I read it, but uh, of course I, I don't really know for sure. But what about Allison and Ethan in the fire tower? Because all that scorched, but she's still fine. Yeah, and they even set it up earlier that like these towers can get burned down with enough fire, obviously. So whenever it just went back to them, I was surprised. And it's such a random example. And I'm not a parent. I'm not about to be a parent, so I'm not here to judge. But this really reminded me of that scene from Lost. Spoilers for Lost, if you haven't watched that. But when, like, Sun and Jin just randomly die together at the end because one of them gets stuck underwater. So then it's like, we'll die together. And I'm just like, look, I get you don't actually have a kid yet. But still, it's like she could just climb down the tower, go back to where her horse was that she rode there and get out of there. She just has a line where she's like, nobody's escaping that fire. And it's like, well, two of our characters literally do that. (laughs) And it's also John Bernthal just kind of like smiles when she says it like, great, we'll die together. And then with our unborn child, like you. Yeah. And then, like you said, the cop out is just, oh, I know he mentioned the tower can be burned down, but it wasn't this time. And she's still just sitting there. So it's like, okay, whatever. This is also nitpicky too, but I was also confused about how whenever her and Connor rappel down the tower, she snapped the other cable when she fell off, but then there's now like a rappelling line set up and she's in a harness, like rappelling down (laughs) with Connor. I was like, where did she get that from? And somehow the assassins who have like two scopes on the whole tower somehow don't see them until they're just now running away at the bottom of the tower. (laughs) There was definitely some dumb things in the movie. Just like Austin said earlier, the dumbest one was probably... They're walking for seemingly forever, and then just at one point, it's like, we can't get around that fire. We got to go back. The chopper's coming. And it's like, oh. And so then they, the next scene is just them back in the tower where they were like 30 minutes ago. It's like, okay, weird. Another thing I wanted to ask you guys. So John Bernthal's character died, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that because I wasn't quite (laughs) sure. (laughs) Yeah, I guess he did. They had to have one person die, I guess. Besides that weird mustached sheriff guy that got shot in the head. Who was eating steak, apparently, for breakfast, but thought it was weird that you could also maybe eat a salad for breakfast. Like, not one of those are breakfast foods. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as wrapping up, I felt like it was pretty realistic. I mean, Connor was pretty confused about where he's going to go now. I mean, he's, he's an orphan now because his mom is already deceased. And now his uncle's dead. Yeah, now his, un- yeah, now his uncle's dead and his dad's dead. So I was like, he's gonna, is he going to stay there with Allison? His aunt by marriage. I was wondering if there was going to be like a scene with them together or something. I was just wondering, like, they really didn't wrap that up of where he was going to go. I thought he was just going to stay with Hannah. Yeah, they did do that thing where she was like, whatever happens, I'll be with you through the whole thing. Next shot is just her dropping him off at an at a adoption agency. <laughs> All right, I got you here. See you, buddy. <laughs> Bye, buddy. God, I got pretty tired of that real quick. She called him buddy like literally every sentence. God, it annoyed me so much. Come on, buddy. <laughs> I don't think she ever said his name once. I think she said buddy every single time. Yeah, <laughs> it was awkward. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, overall, though, I thought the ending was good. Yeah, there were some dumb little things here and there. But again, the whole main crux of the story was this assassin plot. And I thought both of their like uh, demises was pretty cool. I liked seeing the gun battle with the rifle with him and Allison. And then, of course, you have, always have to have that cool moment where you're both out and whoever can reload faster wins. So that was fun. And then the whole axe fight I thought was pretty cool with Nicholas Holt's character. And I liked that Connor actually didn't completely just run off. I liked they did bring him back this time. And then watching him burn alive for that last part was like, oh, geez. Like, that was pretty crazy. So I thought they both got what they deserved. I think overall it wrapped up fine. I think it maybe wrapped up a little bit too neat. Like, I I almost feel like the assassins didn't have enough of a body count to, like, Mm -hmm. actually kind of be, like, memorable villains. But overall, I mean, for everything they set up, I felt like they at least like kind of tied it up in a nice little bow. And you never yeah. got like the you got the you got the news, I guess, making his dad's findings well known. But you never got like the Tyler Perry getting arrested or anything like that. It kind of would have been nice in the news to to find out there like what exactly the information was yeah. that his dad figured out. Like I, that would have been a good way to close out too. I think. 
Another funny thing that I did find myself thinking about was um, they show earlier that he has proof of like what his dad found. But it's like, where was that left? Because if it was on him, then it's ruined with the water. Um, if it was in Angelina Jolie's backpack that she throws, it got burned up by the fire. If it was in the tower, it got burned or shot up. <laughs> no, the tower is safe. Tower is oh, safe. The tower is safe. Uh, unfortunately, John Bernthal was wearing it in his vest that he got shot through 12 times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then at the end, whenever the news comes, I was laughing to myself a little bit like, well, what's his proof going to be? He's just going to walk up and say what he read. But then they're going to be like, OK, cool. Where's the proof? And he's like, oh, fuck. He just like pulls like a wet piece of paper from the water. <laughs> and they're just like, we can't use that. A third a third of it's burned. The bottom half is covered in John Bernthal's blood. And the left half is wet. It cuts to the reporter dropping him off the adoption agency. <laughs> 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 Every version of the movie ends with that. Even the happy ending where Allison and he hug. But then it cuts to him being dropped off by her <laughs> in an adoption agency. <laughs> okay. Well, let's say we live in a universe... We live in a society, as Jared Leto would say, mm. uh, where you can only watch without remorse or those who wish me dead. Which film would you recommend? Easy for me. It's those who wish me dead without a doubt. Same here. I'll third that as well. Yeah, I would definitely pick those who wish me dead out of those. Um, and with that, we are going to start closing things out today. But before we do, we, of course, do need to do our Arnie's podcast awards. If you're new this week, this is a segment where we give an award to anything in this episode. Keith always starts us off. Keith, what is your award today? Don't know if I really have one, a funny one today. I'll do, I'll do a more serious one. And that is the, I think, the most badass award out of both these movies goes to Miss Allison from Those Who Wish Me Dead. I I thought thought she was pretty cool with her rifle and how she easily could have just gone back to town to get shelter, but she was like, nah, I'm going hunting for these bastards. Yeah, Allison kicked ass. Um, I'm going to give the Buddy the Elf Award to Connor just because he gets called Buddy the whole movie, and every time they said that line, I kept thinking of Buddy the Elf for some reason. You know, Buddy the Elf was found in an, in an orphanage of sorts that mm. soon where Connor is going to be. So they do have some connection there. Yeah, I wanted to give Without Remorse an award, but it just was too bad that I can't. And Austin kind of teed me up perfectly there because my award is going to be for the best candidate for an adoption agency. <laughs> and it goes to Connor, <laughs> a.k.a. Buddy. <laughs> Maybe it's the least adoptable child, and that's also Connor. <laughs> yeah, but don't worry, because Angelina Jolie will be there with them for the entire rest of the way, as she kept saying. Cuts to her filling out the papers to put him <laughs> up for adoption. <laughs> that's what she meant by she'll be there. She'll sign the required papers. Oh, Jesus. Well, I hope Connor finds his forever home. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us today, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss any of our upcoming content. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, we really do appreciate that so we can continue to grow this show. At The Arnie's is our social, and the Media is the website. We'll be back next week for another new movie. It's time to talk about Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. That's going to be good. I'm excited for that one. We've been talking a lot about HBO Max original movies, I feel like, with Mortal Kombat and all that good stuff. So we're returning to Netflix. Thank you, Zack Snyder. Like Keith mentioned at the top, we also will be breaking down Loki in the coming weeks. So that should be exciting. Check that out. And Austin and I, as always, because it's once a month, we are doing a new co-op couch episode. Going to be talking about... The video game news for the month, I think we're also going to be breaking down the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Yeah, uh, also check us out on Instagram at the Arnie's. Feel free to direct message us your thoughts on this episode and future episodes. Please go back and catch up on our MCU Phase 1 uh, reviews and uh, give us your thoughts on those, as well as our Falcon and Winter Soldier. And like Matthew just mentioned, please look forward to Loki coming in a few weeks. All right, everybody, have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. See ya. Bye, buddies.